Hi, everybody. This is Jason Key at Harvard Medical School at SB Grid. Thanks for joining today. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Frank Murphy. Frank is at an ECAT. He's the assistant director um, based at the APS. Uh, Frank's going to tell us today about RAPID for uh, uh, automated data analysis. RAPID, RAPID started out basically as a way to auto-index and auto-process data as it came off the detectors and sort of as taken on new features and integrated with a database to keep track of what you're sort of collecting and the results that it's producing. And um, Frank's going to tell us how it's sort of grown and uh, uh, become a sort of full package for automated data processing. So Frank, go ahead. Hey, thanks, Jason. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, always fun to talk about the work. It's much more fun to talk about than to do it uh, for the most part. Um, so I'll just jump in and sort of give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about the rapid, the first version of the package, was, which is what we're currently running uh, on the Beamline here at NECAT. And basically give you an idea of why we made it, uh, what it can do, and give you a little dog and pony show. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the next version, Rapid 2, uh, how it's different, uh, what the current status is, and then I have a show and tell for that as well. Um, if you want to contact me afterwards, uh, I'm sure there's stuff on the SP Grid page, uh, but I threw my email address right there in the presentation. So if you haven't, it, it's nice and handy. Um, so I want to put the uh, credit up front. So this project is a collaboration among a number of people here at NECAT. Uh, most prominently, John Sherman and David No have, have put a lot of work into uh, getting the plugins working well and consistently in, uh, in a very strong manner. I've had a lot of technical assistance from uh, Jim Withrow um, and some assistance with writing some stuff by uh, Kay Perry and Sergeant Banerjee. And we had a lot of support from the other Beamline uh, scientists, uh, always getting pinged for questions about things they like. Uh, our, our, this is all supported by NIH. Uh, we have a NIGMS P41 grant. And one of the ways Rapid works is it's bas basically orchestrating all the actions for data processing. So it's not, it doesn't have a lot of novel uh, data processing built into it. I mean, it uses CCTBX to do some calculations, but it's more figuring out uh, what's coming out of other programs. So I've listed, uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's uh, some of the main players used by uh, Rapid. So, and the way we came to these programs is we basically took the experience that we had processing lots and lots of data sets and figure out what we thought was the most the most robust and hopefully best solutions to uh, data processing that we knew about. Uh, so Rapid, it's as Jason said, it's for automated data analysis and assisted structure solution. So we built it with the idea that uh, users at the Beamline, at our Beamline specifically, but others we were sure, uh, just couldn't get the work done in time. Uh, you know, this was about six years ago. And I, I noticed this, I was sort of new to the Beamline, to actually being a Beamline scientist. I'd been a heavy user previously, but uh, you know, I saw a lot of people shooting blind. So they would just, you know, put a shot, put a crystal on and they'd say, oh, 0 and 90 is good. I'm gonna collect 180 degrees. Um, and you know, that's in my mind was not a good way to make the best or the most of a crystal. I mean, to me, you really wanna, you know, get the photons on just the area you want to maximize the quality of the data coming off. We also had cases where people uh, would not process the data until they were done. They, and by done, I mean their shift would be done, they'd go home and then they'd actually process the data at home. And that was, I don't know if it was the majority of people, but it was, it's very difficult to keep up with data sets. And back then they were five or 10 minute data sets. And, you know, now they're one or two minute data sets. So it's just impossible for a, a one person to keep up with, even a few people have a hard time keeping up with that uh, collection rate. Uh, so right now the Beamline Rapid's got the ability to uh, calculate index and strategies, uh, integration and analysis on the fly. So all that takes uh, place as the data is collected. So you should hopefully have a strategy within about 30 seconds of collecting your test frames and you can apply that to your uh, data run uh, collection and then the integration should be on the fly uh, and you should know, get a good idea before your run's even done how the beginning of your data sort of look. Uh, right now, 
Uh, one of our beamlines has the new Iger detector, and we're not quite set up for that. So that's not exactly the case on the E beamline right now, but uh, it will be soon again. Uh, it also has the capability for some uh, user requested functions. So it can do what I call binary merging. So you can take two data sets and put them together uh, in the browser. And you know you can also uh, reintegrate, which I didn't put on this list. But so for example, if you have a data set and only the first 90 images are good, you can cut it down uh, using the browser. And then you can put together with another data set that maybe you've cut down. So you can add it up. And the binary merging, you can actually, uh, for example, merge A and B, and then add C to A and B, and then sort of bootstrap it that way, if you like. Uh, we also have uh, structure solution uh, plugins. So there's a SAD plugin and a molecular replacement plugin. And they're designed to work on as many cases as we can get them to work on. And as most of you probably know, uh, structure solution can be somewhat of a a tedious process sometimes. So if you have a case that, you know, maybe the signal is very weak, you know, we're trying to make it better for weak cases. Uh, there's some new software out there for that, for that now. Uh, but these uh, plugins are designed with the idea that, you know, if you are, if you have molecular replacement or a SAD project, you can go ahead, punch in the browser, everything will go in the background, it will run on our cluster, which is probably faster than uh, your laptop. Um, and then hopefully you can if you have a positive result, you can say, okay, I'm going to move on from this project to the next project. And that's what we want to do. Um, one of the advantages and, you know, cuts both ways is that it's tightly integrated with our beamlines. So when, as I was saying, when you collect data, it knows about the data, it, it knows a lot of information about it, and then it can make, <coughs> do the processing and present it to you. Um, that cuts in the other direction where when we want to take it and move it to someone else's beamline, it proved to be even more difficult than we even thought it was in the beginning. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So at, at the Beamline now, this is the web interface that we're running. <coughs> Pardon me. And you can, well, I don't know if you can see it, but it's basically a, a tabbed interface. It's based on PHP and it, it's, it's serving up uh, static images, static web pages uh, for the most part. And in this case, what I've done is I've clicked on a snap, it's that, uh, the BC200, this is a pair snap. And what's given us is a good indexing. It's given us some resolutions, ranges for detector distance. And it's given us a nice uh, strategy for data collection for normal and anomalous data collection. I'm gonna cough one more time. <coughs> So I, if you click on the plots, I like to look at things visually. And what it's showing us is uh, where you should start for Omega. So it's drawn this nice black line for where it, uh, the program on the previous page, had told you to start. And what it's trying to tell you is that if you start in the wrong place, you have to collect for much longer oscillation range. So you have to go for over 120 degrees if you're going to pick around 160, 170 degrees. But there's a nice minimum right around here. So for integration, and this is a test crystal, so not everybody uh, can achieve test crystal like uh, Nirvana, but it's going to give you your back of the envelope calculations for what you've collected, what the space group is, your not your uh, parameters, and give you basically your table one information. And we try to give you what we want to see. So when uh, one of us sits down, we say, okay, let let me look at your data and see what it is. You know, you're looking at completeness, you're looking at CC one half, you're looking at your different R factors. Um, and then if you're doing SAD, which a lot of people are, you're gonna look at your anomalous correlation and slope. So we wanted to present it all in one table. You can see it right away. You can see the quality of the data very quickly. Um, and that's the whole idea behind this. Uh, you can get plots as well. You can see there's a plot tab, but what came later and uh, takes longer to run is actually this analysis. And the analysis, you know, it, it's got some custom code that goes and checks your data against a number of different PDBs that are known to be interfering. So basically proteins that have been shown to show up over and over like carbonic anhydrase and 
uh, lysozyme, you know, which some people throw into their preps and gets crystallized sometimes. So it checks to make sure that you didn't accidentally get that in your crystal. And then it actually checks against, uh, we have a basically a local copy of the PDB in a special database, specialized database uh, that it checks your cell edges against. So this is a test crystal. So there's a whole load of solutions. Um, but if this was your novel protein, uh, it would go and look at the PDB and see if there's something similar uh, in cell edges. So maybe you didn't know about it, that's happened, or maybe it's an accident uh, that you actually pulled something else out. Um, and what I wanted to do was then say, okay, <laughs> if you right click on a run, you get sort of this little menu of things you can do. So you can reprocess it, you could merge it with another data set, you could download your data, uh, or you can do a molecular placement or SAD uh, structure solution. So I wanted to go ahead and do, uh, this is a download. So when you download, it'll take a few minutes because it packs up the data into a nice tar zipped up format. And uh, from there, you know, I just want to show you what you actually get. And we try to give you the data in as many formats as you could use. And we give you, you know, your basic, your MTZ or MTZ as, you, as some call it, uh, with free, free R flags already applied. We give you some .SCA formatted files, one with just native and one processed as anomalous. We give you aimless log files and the command files. So if you want to run aimless again yourself, you can see how it was done. Uh, we give you an, an MTZ file that has all the merging information. So this is actually the file that uh, Rapid uses if, if it's going to merge. And what that has is a lot more information about each reflection. Uh, you get a pointless log file, so you can see what pointless thinks about your space group. We also give you all the XDS uh, log files and input files. So you, if you want to go through and, for example, run XDS again or change a parameter and run it again, you can base that off this input file. <clears throat> so we want to make sure that you have all the data in, in several formats so you don't have to go remembering how do I get it into the format that you know program X is going to want. So we give them all to you right up front. And you know, it's just a little bit of and to be honest, we write it for ourselves. And so we sort of uh, eat our own cooking and we just if we really find a format we want, we add it to the software. Um, so if I pull down that menu and I want to do molecular replacement, this is what pops up. Uh, and basically it lets you, you can put in a PDB ID. And in this case, since I, it's Thaumatin, I picked a Thaumatin PDB. Uh, but you can also uh, upload your own. So if you have your own, you know, a lot of labs will be doing uh, molecular replacement solutions on something that they already have a novel MR solution. Uh, so they can do that. Or if they've already uploaded one, you know, if you uploaded one a few minutes ago, it should already be in this prior PDB file. So, you know, you just go ahead and hit launch. <clears throat> and this is what a molecular replacement result looks like. It's very simple. Um, but what it has done is tried every conceivable space group based on the point group uh, that you have in your data. And, you know, uh, it's difficult. It's not that it's difficult to do, but it's another level of tedium that maybe you really don't go back and check your space group. And sometimes it, you can get the right solution if you just try a, a similar space group that you're going to skip. So it's going ahead. And obviously, you know, very rarely are you going to get something that's going to have that large of a log likelihood gain. But you know, this is just sort of an example, and you know, this is the kind of results you'll get. Um, so that's the end of my spiel on what happens at the beam line. Uh, there's a lot more to it, the sad and merging, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, I, I didn't want to inundate you with uh, all those things. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about where we are now with Rapid and what's available in version two. So we think that Rapid has been tested. So the plugins, and that's what we call the actual data analysis uh, framework and intelligence is been run over 1.3 million tasks. So, you know, every year we're hit over almost to 250,000 
indexings and integrations. And we're pretty confident it works well. Uh, if, it, if people have a case that's not working well on, they let us know, uh, hopefully all the time, but most of the time, definitely. Um, so we decided to take this and we wanna package it into a more portable form. So we wanna make it so that you can use a data collection facility. So if another Beamline wants to use it or a home source wants to use it, we wanna make it so that it can work for them and also for individual users. So if you wanna you know, have it and hopefully we'll get it into SB Grid when it hits a, a, what we feel is SB Grid worthy status, uh, you'll be able to go ahead and use these uh, tools. And even if, you know, even if you're using it to make XDS files, you know, I want to make an XDS input file and I didn't get one from the Beamline or I lost it or whatever, you know, you can just do it and see the results and maybe they're good, maybe they're bad, uh, but we think they're pretty good most of the time. Uh, currently we're in alpha testing. Uh, we have a command line interface currently um, and you can do the index and strategy uh, plugin and the integration plugin. And uh, in the coming days, we're going to be adding the other plugins to it. And then we'll be adding a REST, a REST interface that people can use and then a, a, the full interface uh, for people. Uh, so I made a couple movies. And what this is going to show us is if we do an indexing. So the command is really simple, rapid index. Uh, I put the verbose in color mode and I gave it two snaps. Uh, a pair of snaps, they're 90 degrees apart. And since I ran it in verbose, it's going to give us a lot of stuff. And it's going to show us what the images are. And it'll print out the header information that Rapid gets and synthesizes. It sort of puts together some uh, values for itself. And so you can sort of see what's going on. It'll then run, run label it. And I should say, this is the exact uh, robust label it that runs at the beam line. So it's actually running, I think, five instances of label it and picks out the best result. And then runs strategy calculations. Uh, using the program BEST, and if BEST fails, as it does sometimes, it will run a MOSFILM strategy as a backup, so you should get a result. It also does those plots, so it gives you minimal oscillation ranges, uh, and then in this case, the anomalous had a little more texture to it, so it gives you the normal and the anomalous. Um, now, it may be that you want more control, so you need to input uh, X-beam or Y-beam or something like that. Uh, of course, it tells you the programs it used. That's very important. They do the hard work. Uh, but there's a lot of options you can give it, and it'll show us. If you want to know what the options, you just type help. And, uh, you know, you can put in, you can list detectors. Uh, you can determine, you can put in your own space group, or you can use MOSFILM. Uh, you can change the complexity. So you can set all these different things in the indexing, and it'll let you know what's going on. Um, so it can also integrate, as I claim. Uh, and... This, this will run one through, and I'm going to run it in verbose mode again, uh, just so we can see things. And you can see you're just giving it you know, a pretty simple expression of the images you want. Uh, and it'll go through. And in this case, it'll tell us uh, command, line, command line arguments that we did, environmental variables, uh, the images that it's planning on uh, integrating. And then it'll give us, I think, the header information from the first and last uh, image. And this is actually a data set from an R-axis 4, I think. Uh, tells us run information. <laughs> this is sort of an abbreviated data set. It's only 39 images. Uh, it's one I had on my laptop, so I just picked it. And this is not real time. It's much slower than this on my laptop. Uh, it does the XDS processing. You can see this is the same table 1 in ASCII format that we were just seeing in the web format. Uh, and it runs aimless and pointless and decides on a space group. Um, it'll polish up the data. It'll give us a plot of the R merge. I asked the guy, you know, the people here, what plot do you really want to see? Uh, and it'll, you know, just give you R merge so you don't have to go looking through the log files to see if anything's totally insane. Uh, it gives some credit to where the credit is due to the programs. And then again, in this case, you know, you can imagine you want to put some options in, like uh, you want to restrict the resolution range, or you want to tell it which space group to take. I want to reprocess this in P1. So you can see that, you know, you get a lot of the same ones. Space group, beam center, uh, you get solvent fraction, starting image, ending image. Uh, you can actually tell it 
if you want Pointless or XDS to decide the, the space group. So it, it sort of gives you a lot of these options uh, built in. Right now we are, uh, it's in, I would call it an alpha version. So you can actually go to GitHub. Uh, and if you look in the install directory, it's gonna have some instructions how to install it. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we're still in the build out phase. So making the build work for different platforms. Right now it works for, uh, I think it's been tested on CentOS 6 and Scientific Linux and Mac. And it works on those, that three, those three cover a lot of different operating systems. Uh, so that would get a lot of people. But you know, by all means, if you want to go ahead and try it, you know, let us know. Put in, you know, you can put in an issue. Uh, there's only been one issue so far that I put in myself, and it's actually on that uh, data set we just integrated. Uh, but you know, we're using this to build up our repertoire of detectors. So Rapid2 has to know specific information about any detector, not detector type, but actual, you know, the any cat. IDC detector because it's using very specific thing, very specific information, makes it so robust. And it's our thinking that if we get that in in the front end, then it's going to be better uh, long term. So detectors and the other one is operating systems. So if you have an operating system that's not installing on, let us know. You know, we'll take a day or two and we'll work out how to make it work. Um, so I put the credit up again. Because you know, a lot of people have put a lot, a lot of work into these systems. It's if you really think about the number of person hours that go into not only Rapid by these people, but all these projects. You know, innumerable hours that have been put into all those projects, and they really have made crystallography so much simpler than it was. You know. 5, 10, 15 years ago. And I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. And that's what I have. Jason, you got any uh, questions or complaints? <clears throat> so if anybody has questions, um, you can send the questions to me in the chat window. We've got a couple options. You can chat them to me, and I can pass those on. You can also, uh, at least on the Mac, there is a, more, a menu in the bottom right with three little dots. If you go on that, you can go to the Raise Your Flag option. That will flag your uh, user icon, and then I can come and unmute you, and you could ask your question directly. Um, or uh, I think those are the best two options. You could probably send it directly to Frank, but that uh, um, if that happens, then Frank, you just have to reread the question. Uh, um, I can... All right, so we've got one here. Um, so a uh, couple of questions. Um, for strategies after indexing, is there support for using mini capagoniometers and uh, subsequent strategies for avoiding overlaps if you have a long axis? So the mini cap is not in yet, but uh, there, well, okay. So with the beam line, it's in there. So yes, you can click on it and let's see if, uh, let's see. I actually, what I'm gonna do is if it's okay with you, Jason, actually edit this and pull up a web browser and show you, can you see that web browser or do I need to put it on the wrong screen? No, I can see it. Oh, okay. Well, here I'm moving around for no good reason. So I'm gonna go ahead and log into the Rapid site uh, and throw one up here and pull this one. And if they have a snap, um, when you do, if you right click on a snap, you can re-index it or you can do a mini cap alignment. So you actually have to have a solution and you can, Basically, it doesn't know the alignment, and you can tell it, you can choose what type of alignment you want to do. So uh, you can put in, so usually you collect your test images at zero and zero of phi and kappa on our mini kappa. So that's why those are zero. Uh, the program doesn't know what they're set to if they're not zero, but they're generally zero. And then you can pick what you want to do. You can do a long axis. Uh, you can split a, you know, anything you want and just go ahead and run it, and that will give you results for the mini kappa. Uh, Rapid2 doesn't have it yet, but it, it will, uh, I don't want to say shortly, but it will eventually. How's that? <laughs> All right, great. And then um, uh, inverse beam uh, or inverse beam with interleaved wavelengths? 
Uh, so, I mean, there's no, I mean, you, what you can do, the closest thing to that is Moss Film. You can do, Moss Film has Leapfrog, but, you know, the integration of inverse beam, so the integration of inverse beam on our beam line is flawed right now, I believe. Um, but afterward, but Rapid2 should handle it afterwards. Uh, the processing while it's being collected is difficult because they appear as different runs in the beamline system. Um, but it's definitely an issue that we know about. Post-processing with Rapid2, it's very straightforward since they all appear as one run, you know, run one and run 101 typically. Um, but yeah, with, with the uh, Rapid1 system, it's not properly handled. I believe. So one thing I, I had a question about as well is, does Rapid actually set up or initiate data collection or is that done separately and then Rapid uh, is just waiting for data to come off the detector and then does its thing? Right, it just waits. It's, yeah. it's, very, it's very hopeful that data will be collected, but it doesn't actually initiate anything yet. And is Rapid2 the same? Rapid2, yeah, I think Rapid2 will be the same. Um, if anybody's collected any cat, you know, we would like to make it so that you can, uh, if you've done remote data collection, you get that little uh, sort of thumbnail of strategy next to your data, your data that has been collected, um, which would be nice to actually, oh, don't need my calendar. So that looks like this. Let's see if somebody's active. Somebody's usually active. No, nobody right now. So we, ah, there we go. So if we observe this beam line, for example, yeah. So you know when you take an image, um, if you get a strategy over on the side, let's see if we've got one. Yeah. So if you get a strategy over here, um, I think we'd like to add an ability to just say you know collect this data um, with this strategy. But that doesn't really exist yet. Uh, question from uh, Pete Meyer here in the group. Uh, does the molecular replacement part of Rabbit, can you do different numbers of copies? Can you search for four or three? Oh, or... uh, yeah, I think it does do that. Uh... Could you do two different models, like a sequential or something? That I don't think you can do yet. But, you know, I think that's one of those things where if you have a good case for requesting it, that's the kind of thing people love a little challenge like that. Uh, so that's this. Um, as I recall, let's see, you can, uh, you can select uh, molecules in ASU. Now, if you give it, as I recall, um, I'm 95% sure about this, if you give it a PDB that has, say, four chains, it will try each chain individually. I don't think it try. It doesn't try them, you know, A and B and A and C and A and D. But it will try A, B, C, I believe. And the other interesting thing, uh, I'm not well. I'm not sure how interesting it is, but uh, in SAD, you know, there's the case of disulfide bridges. Sort of, I guess you could, some people call them super atoms. So you know. You have these two sulfurs next to each other. So we have uh, a lot of cases where people, when they are doing sulfur sad, they want to see disulfide bridges because it just makes it a little bit, you can sort of bootstrap a little more easily. So that was a new addition this year. And you can pick any atom you want. That's I think cool. they're alphabetical. I've got a question about, uh, as you're going to rapid two, and so the first version you built obviously was sort of tied into any CATS infrastructure and you've got the compute resources yeah. and the super speedy network to move things around. I don't think most other sites probably won't necessarily need to have the beefy compute resources, but um, as you move it to say a lab-based setup, what would you recommend on the, on the back end for, I mean, can you do this on a desktop? Would you do this, you're running it on your laptop. If you're setting up for a group, do you, would you want you know, a, a small cluster, big so, storage? What do you think? I think it all depends how, you know, how big your group is, right? I mean, personally, 
if I was, you know, a PI starting a new lab, I wouldn't buy any computer. Well, I'd buy, you know, thin clients or laptops or iMacs or something for people and then run it AWS, uh, which, you know, I've played with AWS. You can certainly, you know, do things. And I think Jason, you were uh, talking about, you know, SB Grid getting to that point. Because ADL, I, I, people always overestimate how much they use their computers uh, in my mind. So I would move to AWS if I was an assistant professor, uh, but a lot of people aren't like that. So I would say you get, you know, we just bought some servers just recently and for 10 grand, you can get, you know, a server that could support a lab easily uh, in my mind, you know, it, it's really the computing resources are sort of amazing right now. Uh, we just purchased four or five nodes uh, that we're building, a, I guess, a mini cluster to support the Iger uh, doing uh, shared memory for the images. So I would think one node would one node cluster would be enough to support uh, even a pretty good sized lab that's not doing, I mean, it depends, how, how active are you? I think most people are not that active, to be honest. Okay. I am. Um... On that note, what oh, schedule? Oh, oh, what, schedules you are. Are you working with? <laughs> what schedulers are you supporting on the cluster? And do you, you use a scheduler, or you have your own? Um... Uh, so our, the way, well, we use uh, what? What is it that we use? We use QSub. Okay. So we have a QSub cluster, uh, but the way the way Rapid Two. So the so we're rolling Rapid Two to a few different beam lines, and the first beam line we're rolling to does not use QSub, so they use something else. So the way we've built it is we use uh, Redis to pass messages between different uh, sections of the program, and there's a cluster section that you know you can change uh, what how it's actually going to write run. So we basically have to write a plugin for that that for each different cluster. So we're hoping to build up those plugins. So you know, obviously the QSub one will work because we know how to do that, and then the next and the next. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um... Sort of echo your sentiments with uh, AWS or even M or Google's Compute Cloud, which is even uh, cheaper because the um, the upload of data is free. So if you just bring back the integrated intensities, those are small. Those yeah. are where they charge you. So it's it can be very affordable. And when you're using it, you sort of um, wonder why we buy racks of computers anymore, right? Because it's you know it's always ready and ready to go. So it has its real strengths. So it's, yeah. it's pretty, I agree. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I think so, non non experts, and I, I even myself, I'm not a computer expert, but non computer experts don't appreciate uh, how powerful the cloud are now. Yeah, it's it's pretty great. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it for questions. Frank, thank you very much. Uh, keep an eye out for Rapid Two. We'll be looking for it and uh, look forward to getting that out into more users' hands. If anyone else has questions, feel free to. You can email Frank, you can email me, I can pass it on. And uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason.